Hope you've meditated on uh, the good day that it is. It's 7-Eleven. I always think of July 7-Eleven like the, the grocery store, well, the convenience store. We have one down the street here. And uh, we're not a convenience store, but we do have something convenient. And something you can walk in or, or you can get anytime, 24-7, open. And that's the convenience of the Word of God given to you. And it will be given to you this day. So welcome, welcome to those um, watching us from the, our live stream. Good to have you with us. Um, I'd like to say if you would uh, please comment and say hello to us. If you have any prayer requests you would like me to pray for you, uh, our church look over for you this week. Please add those in the comment section as well. We do our matin service today um, at, at home. If you have a Lutheran service book, the matin service can be found on pages 219 through 228 of the Lutheran service book. Um, announcement for after church today Adults, um, we continue our study in the book of Song of Songs. And what we are doing there is interpreting a, a very metaphorical book that has tons and tons of images. And it all applies to the church. It applies to the means of grace, word, and sacrament. And yes, it's a, it's a heavy, heavy love story. But it's not like the type of love that we know. And it's, it's funny because we're known as the bride of Christ. And that's everybody in this room. Um, I'm the bride of Christ. Well, how can I be married to Christ? Well, the song tells us. It tells us uh, clearly in a thousand pictures. Not so clear, but the thousand pictures clear that up for us. So I, I invite you to uh, come partake of that truth and, and doctrine and purity. Uh, get sanctified by the word. That's what adult Sunday school, all Sunday school is really about as we turn our hearts now um, to what God has prepared for us here in this worship service this day. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship Him. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep. the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. 
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship Him. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive your word and view us with your Holy Spirit so that we may believe in your word and take it to others as we depart from here today. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Old Testament reading, Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amy, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuary of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, went to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. O Lord, have mercy on us. We chant the gradual back and forth together. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The epistle reading is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he sent forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. 
King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guest, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This, O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Maybe see it as we sing our hymn of the day, number 524, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. You come to church in order to get to know how to apply the divine gospel to your life, and rightly so. But what about when you get to the true and historical accounts like this one in our gospel text for today? How do we apply the mess that went on there? King Herod Antipas the weak, son of Herod the great, Herodias, his brother's wife. No, wait, not his brother's wife anymore. No, now his unlawful wife. Then the seductive dancing of Herodias' daughter, all the way up to John the Baptist's head on a platter. Surely these matters have nothing to do with us in the here and now. For I have nothing in common with them, is what is maybe going through your head. However, with the devil alone, we have nothing in common. But with all humanity, we have many things in common. All partake of the same nature with us. They inhabit the same earth. They are nourished with the same food. They have the same Lord. They have received the same laws. They are invited to the same blessings with ourselves. So let us not say then that we have nothing in common with them. The listener must ask then, what does this tell us about God? What does this tell us about man, about me? And then how now does it change me? We start first with John the Baptist at the beginning, after he had met the Christ at the Jordan. When he then there is exalting Christ before the people, stating that they bear witness that he himself is not the Christ, John says rather, you know what I am? I am the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, I doubt John the Baptist was thinking that his decrease meant for his head to be put on a platter. But no, this is drama at its best. Perhaps the first soap opera in the New Testament. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. But now to Herod. He hears Jesus is on the scene and immediately has fear and guilt. Fear and guilt that cause suspicion that the baptizer had even returned from the dead. For Herod then stands by Jesus' cousin's execution. John being executed by beheading after being put in prison by Herod. And all this started because of Herodias' grudge against John. All because John preached to them that it is not lawful to have your brother's wife. John preached the law, but he also preached the kingdom of God, that it was at hand. And that's the very well-developed assessment that St. Mark here is giving us of Jesus and of the execution of John the Baptist. It is kingdom irony and also people's character irony. There is, though, an artistic purpose to this drama because Mark is able to contrast the King Herod to Jesus, Jesus, King Jesus, who brings the eschatological reign and rule of God as king, son of David, as well with Jesus' epitaph on the throne of his cross that read, King of the Jews. This is in contrast to Herod, who is living to be glorious and focused on himself, qualities that are opposed to Jesus being humble and focused on others. Mark presents us a strong picture of life outside the reign and rule of God, under the fallen and resistful reign of rule of man. But Herod, knowing of Jesus, and Herod no, knew John, even feared John when he spoke to him, John speaking to him because Herod knew that he was a righteous and holy man. Herod listened to John speak gladly, but it greatly perplexed him. So he just kept him in prison. That was the safety Herod provided him, which was good in his eyes. But safety from what? Was John the Baptist that much of a threat? Yes, to Herod, being convicted of sin was threatening because self-glory and self-righteousness are perplexed when the heart is struck with an offense. Perplexed when how come these righteous men have to come along and ruin how I think things should be? And so Herod's sin is haunting him. And this is why when he hears of Jesus, he has no doubt that it's John whom he believed to be raised from the dead. It is a self-centered and eerie estimate of what is happening. In Herod's mouth, then, his words are words of guilt. And Herod, at the heart of the matter, is weak. He has not the courage to repent. And Herodias, in her confidence in herself, knows this. Therefore, she knows that if she can apply more pressure than John had, 
from her side that she will win Herod over to her side. Manipulation sets in, and so he harms another to save his own face. This text is recapping on the opportunity that presented itself. Deliberate actions from Herodias and her daughter, which confirm their evil intent. Herod then throws a big birthday party bash, and he does it to get brownie points with the nobles, the men of prestige and high social position. For Herod is obsessed with what others think about him. His social reputation, after all, is being put on the line. So the mother and daughter plan scheme to mock the big event, saying, in effect, let's make this a really wicked dinner party. First, lust comes into play because Herod sees the girl dancing and is so enticed he vows to give her whatever she wants, even up to half his kingdom, which he actually did not have the political power to be able to give that much away. But he nonetheless makes an oath to the conniving Herodias, calls for an immediate request for John the Baptist's head on a platter. After that is what the girl asks for, with the words from her mother. Herod then, at his worst, shows his weakness, his corruption, and just how shallow he is. Herod ironically attempts to save his honor by taking John's life. But it says the king was exceedingly sorry. This is not repentance, but a confession of guilt. He does not convert to what John had offered him, and he had no strength to refuse the vicious scheme. He could have repented and simply told his guests that he has no intention of staying committed to a mistake, but the head of others is a small price to pay for the maintenance of powerful people on top to maintain their life in, the world, in their world. The thing about this all is in this tragic story of John is that it foreshadows of what awaits Jesus. There's a strong parallel of John and Jesus just as a contrast between Herod and Jesus. John and Jesus are connected. And the bridegroom's friend does meet an unhappy end, like Jesus did as well. Thus, this message includes a message that martyrdom stalks those involved in proclaiming and spreading the reign and rule of God, including Jesus and his followers. The tit for tat, the uncomfortable duplicity, or I like to call it divergent survival, is a drama of rejection and violence. And that is why we need Jesus to help us have integrity, faith, and trust, because through them he will turn the antagonism on its head. And see the differences now of the two kings. Herod associates with the powerful. Jesus associates with sinners and outcasts. The weak Herod is unable to deal with his difficulty. And though subject to human woes and who went through feeling deeply grieved, Jesus is able to deal with difficulties in a God-pleasing way. Herod is cowed by others. Jesus is control of the situation with others. Herod presides over the death of another for his own gain. Jesus offers himself to death for others. And yes, there is always consequences for one's sinful actions. The historian Josephus, recording one of the consequences of Herod's actions, writes that also because of Herodias, uh, Herod rages a war with Eratos. Eratos is Herodias' dad. And he didn't like the unlawful marriage part either, nor the beheading of John. So they had to get rid of him, too. But Eratos was king of a powerful neighboring region of Judea. And when the war arose, Herod's entire army was destroyed. No more noble men to throw a party for. No more prestige or face to show. And Herod was later exiled and put to death because of more plotting with Herodias' intents that it became a domino life effect. And it kept failing. If one does not learn from their mistakes, as all of scripture gives us these accounts, to learn ourse from ourselves their mistakes. That's why all these messy stories are in the Bible, to learn from them. But isn't that kind and wonderful? Jesus doesn't wait or want us to do these same things to ourselves. So rather in his word, he gives us account and testimony of what people had done bad, wickedly and wrong, so that we learn from them and do not commit the same mistakes. This account, this example, is for our times and how we act and think according to right teaching and rebuke. The idiom, wanting someone's head on a platter, that is a phrase that throughout history has been used as a picture of destroying someone in anger and hostility, wanting to get rid of them. And it portrays that evil picture of the ideal that at least the other person would cease to talk, that you don't have to listen to their rebukes. 
Do I really need to listen? Or does it have the pleasing sin become the priority? Our priority should be listening to those whom God calls, his best man to stand by him when his bride appears, not siding with the prestige of the industry of society. Christ did not die for that. He died so that you shouldn't have to become a martyr like John the Baptist for speaking what is right. Though many may just have to do that because of the remaining faithful. Yes, they want to crucify Jesus for it, and Jesus lets them because he does what he has to do. But now hear this. There is grace in this text for those willing to receive it. It is when you see what the one who was raised from the dead endured in order to establish a new rule and reign and to be a host of a new and unselfish party. For Jesus will renew your head, that is your mind and your soul, in this fashion so that you do not seek to take others' heads and lead them astray. Though today we are given the picture of being put into this account of a wicked party and of sinister proportion, we are freely given the mind of Christ so that we no longer are wanted guests to self-pleasing parties and their party favors. Instead, we are partakers of the Lord of Lord and King of Kings and his increase. Renewal, right decisions and choices by the ways of Christ, by the ways of Christ and John, that is what makes you true followers and examples of Christ. But as John was laid into a tomb, which appears to be the ultimate decrease, resurrection comes. For the re rejection and the violence cannot overcome the actual risen Lord. His victory over death in the grave shows how wonderfully he can turn such antagonism into life and salvation. You take a holy man's head and put it on a platter, but then Jesus will take it and put a crown on it. Why was John allowed to die? What occurred was not death, but a crown. Not an end, but the beginning of a greater life. And this is how then you reap the benefits of this soap opera and how you think like a Christian. That faithfulness unto the end receives the crown of eternal life. The gospel of the kingdom displays that fear and guilt are the result of unrepentance. But the society of the kingdom of God at hand has redemption. Though the body be imprisoned and the flesh confined, when you hear the truth, the gospel of your salvation, you get sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance. And how you are to acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory that we now walk, you do it not in the plot or dilemma of saving face, but by the restoration and maturation of his grace. It is what defines you, defines your walk, and it is what binds up any snares along the path. For you too know Jesus' name, but it does not haunt you. For it is the same today as it was back then, Savior. And yes, it is he who has been raised from the dead. Because he came down from heaven to put on flesh in order to identify with all your identities or any many faces you choose to wear. And because of his victory, he now holds the power to solidify your true identity in and with him. Jesus never focused on himself, but is focused on you. He will turn antagonism on its head to lead out the confined, and his honor cannot be matched. It is unparalleled. John may as well have uttered at his death his last words, you can cut my head off, but I know one who will give me a new one. You too are the bridegroom's friend if you are in the royal court of the church. Your joy too is made complete here in it. John the Baptist should still resonate in our heads, though, our thoughts. His losing was not lost for ill purpose. For Jesus turns his head and all heads towards him now. It is what he salvages on a better platter than Herodias's. How weak the effort of my heart, how cold my warmest thought. But when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. Till then I would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath. And may the music of thy name refresh my soul in death from how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. So one, what does this have to do with God? Jesus is made known. Two, what does it have to do with you? He has to do with you. Therefore, you are one and the same. And three, how has it changed you? Well, meditate on that this week. But I'll give you a hint, though. See number two above. His relation. 
and all your scenes of life. Change the plot and reverse the drama. And yes, so are the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We now rise to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now praise and acknowledge him through the Te Deum.
to you, O Lord. by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Dear Lord, since you have sent us forth in this world to testify to your word, preserve your church for your name's sake in righteousness and faithfulness, and let us find conviction and confidence in our confession, for your good and your love does endure. O oh Lord, sustain your creatures and make them bold to proclaim your law against sin and your word to humble the proud and bring them to repentance, that they would hear the gospel and receive the forgiveness of sins won for them by Christ. Also, we ask you to vindicate all who suffer for continuing steadfast in their callings and keep us from despising your word of correction, because Christ, your Son, our Lord, has paid the ultimate price for our reproof. You, O Lord, are king over all the earth. You bring ruin on wicked nations and their rulers and are no respecter of persons. Spare our nation and its leaders. Let the conduct of our civil servants and of our people be wise, just, honorable, and in accord with your revealed will. Be merciful to those who oppose you. And remember that you desire all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth in the Lord. Heavenly Father, you have adopted us through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we bring before you every need of body and soul of your children, especially lavish the riches of your grace on Robert, Bob, Antonio, Glenn, Stephen, Walter, Ed, Oneida, Kathy, Ed, Shane, Dorothy, Larry, Marilyn, Jane, and Elena, that having comfort in your grace, they may withstand the ailments that overtake them and lean on your everlasting arms. You have blessed us, O oh Father, in every trial and tribulation, to know that you still redeem us and have prepared for us a crown of everlasting life. So in all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Pray together. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over you. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord 
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our hymn to depart is number 919, Abide, O Dear Jesus. Blessings on the rest of your day. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Yes,